Welcome to the CMO Spotlight, and I'm here with Laura Trotter, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of the USIS Division of Equifax. So welcome, Laura. Thank you, Joe. It's very great to be here. Thanks for being here. Um, so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about Equifax, the company, and then about the USIS division, and then your role there. Sure. So Equifax at a high level is a global data analytics and technology company. Um, we have a unique blend of differentiated data, analytics, and technology that really lets us create insights that power decisions and help businesses provide really a seamless positive experience during what I call life's pivotal moments. So whether that's applying for a mortgage or financing an education or buying a car, um, Equifax helps businesses make those decisions. Um, the company was born over 120 years ago. Um, we have over 13,000 employees in 24 countries, and uh, we're headquartered here in lovely Atlanta, Georgia. Great. So um, the, the division that you're responsible for marketing for is the USIS division. I think you were saying that there's sort of three divisions of Equifax. So tell us about the USIS division. Yeah. So I was appointed as the chief marketing officer for Equifax's USIS business unit in February of this year. So I'm still a relative newbie. Um, Equifax is comprised of three business units, USIS being um, one of the largest. Um, but USIS provides, um, but we have both a consumer side of our business as well as a business side of our, of our business unit. On the consumer side, we provide consumer credit monitoring, identity theft protection services. And on the business side, we offer risk information, commercial identity and fraud solutions, financial marketing and analytical services. Great. And so I know you mentioned you've just been there about six months. So mm -hmm. if you could just tell us a little bit about your career journey that led you to Equifax. Yeah. So I like to always say that I started my career um, in sales selling drugs in Florida. Um, now, that's legit On the drugs. Street. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, legit drugs. And that was for a very legit company. Um, and I like to say that because I'm not, you know, I'm not sure why I appreciated it at the time, but that experience really helped me um, have a genuine appreciation of what it's like um, to carry a quota and to be a salesperson and what they go through on a daily basis, which in turn, I think really made me a better marketer. Um, and then from there, I, my heart was always really in marketing. Um, I've held a number of marketing positions, mostly B2B, but a sprinkle here and there of um, consumer as well. Um, several Fortune 500 companies like Qualcomm, um, Illumina, Motorola, and Nokia, they've since been gobbled up by even bigger companies. Mm -hmm. um, but also some mid-sized companies, WebMD, um, Accurate Background most recently, and even some smaller companies as well, which are also a blast, JAMA Software, um, and ID analytics. Wow. Uh, those are some great brands though. I mean, every one of those brands I've heard of and, and either been a consumer of their products or business consumer of their products in some cases. Yeah. Very cool. So I'm curious, just in terms of your career path, is there advice that you wish that you had gotten very early in your career or is there advice you'd maybe give to somebody who's brand new starting out in their career? Yes and yes. Um, I would say that, you know, earlier on in my career, I was very focused on the work, on like what it was that I needed to do or what I accomplished. But I would say now, I would say never underestimate the value of relationships, mm. um, you know, especially when you need to get difficult things done. Prioritize the people side of things always and often. Um, so I believe that everybody has a superpower. And I'm curious if you, what you believe your superpower to be, or maybe what other people have told you your superpower is. Yeah, I think my super superpower is really um, around grit and resilience. Mm. I think the saying goes something like, enthusiasm is common, um, endurance is rare. Um, marketing sometimes involves taking risk, um, trying experiments that don't work. And really the ability to rebound from failure is key. And I, I find that really seeking the learnings from those experiences is something that I enjoy and find exciting. So I guess I would say that would be my superpower. Awesome. So 
uh, you started this job in the midst, hopefully towards the tail end, but in the midst of a global pandemic. So other than the challenges that come with the pandemic, I'm curious if there's a specific marketing challenge that you got excited about in taking the job. Yeah, well, so I'll say that what I, my answer here is not necessarily something I've experienced at Equifax, but I've experienced it enough at other companies that I thought it might help your, your listeners. Um, you know, I've worked at companies where marketing is really given just lip service only. Um, sometimes that's for good reason, right? There, sometimes marketing casts too wide of a net. Mm. And so this lack of, of focus really can have a negative impact on um, results. But sometimes though, I think people um, think they understand marketing because they've been exposed to marketing. And look, while I'm always open to suggestions and ideas, mm -hmm. I, I do tend to bristle a bit when people equate marketing to kind of your fast food drive through where they simply order what they want versus really yeah. what they need. So, yeah, it's, it's certainly not transactional like some would think, I would say. That's right. Um, so I'm curious where you find inspiration either for yourself or for your team. Yeah, I think my team finds inspiration in a multiple, um, multiple different ways. Um, but I think if I had to highlight, I'd say the first thing is really connecting actions to results or impact. Um, and then also making sure that people really understand the bigger purpose. So, um, for example, at Equifax, one of the things that we do is we um, expand access to credit for those consumers that might not have an extensive credit history. That's kind of a big deal. Um, we help businesses say yes to these customers um, more. And that's a purpose that I think really the team and I can really get behind. Um, number two, I would say, is really looking outside. Marketers, you know, like everybody, can have, um, can fall victim to what I'll call myopic perspective, having a myopic perspective. And so I really encourage the team to look outside. So I'll share examples of great work that, you know, maybe I see in other industries. Um, we all kind of listen to a, there's a podcast called the state of demand gen that I really like um, that will, that we share on the regular. It doesn't mean we always agree with everything. And sometimes we'll get into little mini debates on the team about it, um, but it's always a great dialogue. And then finally, you know, I think the team really sees, gets in, inspiration from one another you know, we all need a source of inspiration now and then. So sometimes seeing and hearing what your peers are doing um, not only can, you know, spark that creative juice, but also even trigger a related but different thought or idea mm -hmm. um, for your own work. Yeah, I, I hear a lot from particularly people on the more creative side of marketing. Art and culture can often be mm -hmm. a real source of fueling an idea, even if it's not directly relatable to the business, you know, it's like at least that creativity will cause uh, business creativity in other ways. That's right. Yeah. Music does the same thing. I think anytime we look at, again, other people's really fantastic creative um, execution, we're like, wow, that's really great. And sometimes it just triggers an idea of, wow, that, how, how could we, what could we learn? What can we pull from that? Um, in our own work. Yeah, that's great. Well, I, I'm curious. Um, so, so as you may know, set up we're matchmakers that often connect brands and marketing agencies together. So we're not marketing agency. We're not on the client side. We're somewhere in between. And so we often think about that relationship between brands and agencies. So I'm just curious, you don't have to be specific, but Generally, how do you like to work with marketing agencies? Yeah, so Equifax uses um, several agencies that span across um, multiple marketing disciplines, public relations, creative and marketing strategy, digital, video, sales engagement, event marketing, and so forth. I think, you know, the, the list is, is, is broad. We do have a couple of, of agencies that we are, um, that know us very well, understand our complex, um, candidly business. And so we work with them more often, but we do work with a number of different external agencies. And um, are there certain disciplines that you feel usually should be kept in-house because they're core to your business? And are there certain other disciplines where you almost always would like to get external perspective because you think that's you know important to get a yeah. 
outside of your walls? Yeah. You know, I think the answer to this question is it depends. Mm. Um, the answer depends on the size of the company, your in-house talent, um, how much work there is to do, like what your bandwidth, what your budget is, that kind of thing. This said, I do think that people should avoid outsourcing, if at all possible, um, measuring marketing's performance or impact. Mm. In my experience, at least, some agencies um, like to hang their hats on vanity metrics, like impressions or right. number of leads. Um, and while these metrics are fine, you know, from an, a leading indicator perspective, um, I think one really needs to understand how activity drives results. And for that, really having an understanding of your own CRM, um, your marketing automation platform, that kind of thing is really important for marketers to have that capability in, in house. That's great. So um, as marketers, you talked about bristling sometimes when people misunderstand you know, certain aspects of marketing. Right. Uh, we often work with really closely with members of the organization who don't live and breathe marketing. And so I'm curious, how, how do you like to demonstrate the value that marketing brings to the non-marketing functions within the organization? Yep. Two things. And I'm sure my team could actually answer this question at mimicking me. Two things, <laughs> pipeline and revenue. And that sounds really, really obvious, but at the end of the day, how much pipeline, how much revenue has marketing either sourced or influenced through its, its efforts? Now, again, there's a whole slew of leading indicators that as marketers, we have to understand, we have to optimize around. But at the end of the day, what am I doing? What is my team doing to really drive the business forward? I love that. Um, so since you've only been at Equifax six months or so, it might this might be an example from a previous life, but I'm curious if there's a specific campaign or program that you've worked on that taught you a great deal, either because it was a miserable flop and you needed to learn <laughs> that hard lesson, or it was a big success and you'd like to figure out a way to emulate it again in the future. Yeah, this was this is a great question. I, I'm going to um, grab an example from my past. Okay. Um, there's a campaign that um, I was involved in um, with a previous employer called For All You Seek. Um, the campaign was really conceived to appeal on an emotional level using the voice of customer um, that really emphasized the common aspiration of, again, our target audience, which was scientists at the time, to really seek scientific solutions. Um, the campaign was a nested campaign strategy that represented this overarching uh, corporate brand message, um, but also had uh, included several multiple, um, sorry, it included multiple industry um, campaigns that were, that were slotted underneath this uh, using the same theme. So it was multi-channel, multi-audience, and it was leveraged across paid, earned, owned social channels, but it was really um, integrated um, as well. And it was even used internally. Um, I think what I learned from this campaign is number one, the power of consistency and repetition. I think us marketers really got tired of the campaign way before you you always know, the market yeah. did, right? Yeah. Um, and then um, secondly, I think it was the first example that I had of like, this is what really truly integrated marketing looks like. Um, you know, at first blush, this company had um, several wildly disconnected industries that it served, everything from agrogenomics to forensics to microbiology. And so one could have really made an argument that there's no way you're going to come up with a campaign or a concept that that was able to really resonate to all of these industries. And um, the, the, we did, and so and it and it, it really resonated, which was um, which was a, was a nice thing to have happen. And I think the third thing was like how important the interlock with sales really is. Mm -hmm. So activating your sales team to catch, especially if you're doing some lead generation, to catch leads, especially if that's a new motion for the company, you know that's no joke. That can't be the importance of that can't be um, overstated. So. Yeah, I spent eight years in a previous life at a B2B you know, company and that interchange between marketing and sales and alignment between the two, mm -hmm. I think the best organizations 
have a shared common goal and they have a, a clear definition of what quality in terms of leads looks like. That's right. So they're all driving towards the same set of, you know, KPIs and the same set of, of, of metrics to, to, you know, of, of what's going to be a good quality lead versus a bad quality lead. Um, and the other thing I'll add is that B2B doesn't have to be boring. At the end of the day, you are still influencing, Absolutely. You're, you're influencing a person who, or a group of people to try to get them to make a potential buying decision. And we live, you know, to, to, our, to our conversation earlier about art and music and culture and how it influences things we do. We live in the real world and we're real humans. And so B2B has an opportunity to really impact people to get them to, you know, change their minds or make decisions or take actions based on our our. That's creative. such a great point, Joe. I think that, you know, people sometimes forget that, you know, even though the B2B sale is typically a complex one with lots of buyers and influencers and all that, but at the end of the day, we, we, you and I were people, the people that we are, are marketing to and that we're selling to, they're, they're humans, they're, you know, they're people. The more we can keep that in mind as marketers and by the way, sellers, um, the better off we're going to be. I think that we, we get a little bit abstract sometimes in the B2B world. So keeping that fundamental, just <laughs> basic that, you know, at the end of the day, we are people at the end of the day. It's really important. Love it. yeah. All right. I'm going to completely shift gears and ask you some questions just for fun. Um, okay. To wrap things up. The first is, is there a sports team or a book or a movie or a quote or a band that really inspires you? And what is it about them that inspires you? Yeah, that this is uh, there's several. But I think <laughs> you the can one pick more than one if you'd like. <laughs> the one that comes to mind is from the author slash poet Maya Angelou. Um, she has lots of great quotes, um, but the one that really resonates with me is: um, "People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will always uh, remember how you made them feel." Um, and I think for me, um, that this had this this really implies is that. Um, the fact that intent really doesn't matter. In other words, you may have not intended to um, hurt someone's feelings, for example, um, when you said or did something, but it, it, it kind of doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, relationships are inherently hard. Um, they're great to start off with, they're easy, but you know, they require maintenance and consistent effort and care. Um, you know, but for me, the strength of my relationships, both professionally and personally, is the most fulfilling aspect of life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Maya's quote really, you know, brings that home for me. Um, I love that. Uh, so outside of your family, which is always an obvious answer to a question like this, where do you find joy outside of work? Do you have any hobbies or anything that you really mm -hmm. love? Nature. Um, so uh, love a good hike, anything mm -hmm. outdoors, but wildlife as well, too. So um, I live on about four and a half acres here in lovely awesome. Suwannee, Georgia. And we have um, red tail hawks that come and frequent our backyard um, on the regular. So, you know, whether it's those really majestic, you know, hawks that fly over um, or whether it's the tiny little green lizard that I swear are listening to me when I'm outside <laughs> doing um, gardening. Um, I just love to get my hands in the dirt, look at the clouds and the sky and just be so. Yeah, that's great. Well, it, talk about literally grounding you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. I, I, I think sometimes we do as humans need to take our shoes off and have our feet in the grass or in the dirt, just because I think that provides some nourishment for us, just like plants. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm curious if there's a brand that you've never worked on that you really admire and what is it about them that you might admire? This is a great question because I actually had this thought cross my uh, mind the other day. I was ordering my 13 year old son uh, new shoes for the upcoming you know, new school year. And um, it's, oh, he was, or I was ordering a pair of Nikes and I it was reminded, gosh, I love this brand. I love what they do from a product and marketing perspective. Um, I, I lived in Portland, Oregon uh, for several years and I had several friends that worked there and it just, it's just sounded like such a really cool place to work. And again, 
back to the creativity, you know, that their marketing department really, you know, puts in again on the products or on the, on the, their category marketing and all that really just ceases to amaze me. In fact, there was a guy in our neighborhood who oh, he's retired now, but he was one of the lead um, folks on a campaign, the, the Bow Nose campaign. Oh, yeah. And he had a license plate on his car that said just Bow Nose. And I just always thought like, how cool is that? That a campaign <laughs> that occurred back in the late eighties, you know, it's still like people still, oh, well, not everybody, but people of my, my generation understand, like they remember like the Bo oh, yeah. campaign. Um, and that was, that was so, Bo, Bo, Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson, the in, legendary in the spots, Bo Jackson. Bo Jackson yeah. was like good at every sport kind of That's thing. Right. So, That's right. That's right. And, and then at the end, I, I'll never forget that they had uh, Bo Jackson playing the guitar uh, 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 with Bo Diddley, I think. It was Bo Diddley and Bo Jackson. Yes. And it's like, he even can play the guitar. That's right. <laughs> yep. The legendary Bo Jackson. Yep. Well, uh, we, my old agency uh, also worked on Nike, on the Nike business. And I can tell you that it's for real. The people that work there, for example, go for a run together and have a meeting while they're going for a run or playing a sport. So it's it's not just uh, it's not just it's part of the corporate culture. Yeah, the creative they culture. they have a um, they have a company store in Beaverton, um, which is actually where their headquarters yeah. are located in the suburb of, of Portland. And one of the things that always amazed me is that as an employee, I think you got like half a dozen passes to the employee store a year, that's it. And you could gift them to other people. And I was fortunate enough to, to get several passes to this company store on occasion. And you, the line to get in the store would wrap around the building like three times. And by the way, these are people that are waiting in line in a, in a, a complex in Beaverton for hours just to go uh, buy things, right. Nike branded things. And I thought this is this is powerful. This is, yeah. this is some neat stuff. So I love that. Yeah. All right. My last question is a silly one. I'm wondering if there's a fictional story or a realm that you would like to live in if you weren't living in this realm. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is maybe perhaps a little embarrassing for me to admit, but um, as a young girl, I grew up reading all of the Laura Ingalls Wilder um, books I think just because she had my same first name and I yeah, thought right. she must be cool, right? right. <laughs> you know, um, but I used to daydream that Laura Ingalls Wilder was with me, like in the, the present, the, the modern world, if you will, when I, again, when I was younger and I would teach her and show her about all the, you know, like the cool inventions that we have. And that I would, I, she'd literally just be by my side throughout my day. So I think if I had to, if I had to pick a genre or a, or a time period, I'd like to go back to Laura Ingalls Wilder time and see what it was like to live uh, with Ma and Pa back on the farm and and uh, and learn from her. Cool, except you'd bring your smartphone and make that they would all be <laughs> wildly like confused by all of the technology. We'd have to take some selfies, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, I love it. Well, Laura Trotter is the Chief Marketing Officer of the USIS Division of Equifax. Thank you so much, Laura. This has been fantastic. It's been a blast. Thank you very much, Joe.